You see, how can my brother ever succeed if I am there trying to tear him down? If I'm filled with hatred to the point to where I'm trying to hold him back from his blessings, how is my brother ever to succeed if I'm busy doing that? How am I supposed to succeed if my brother on the flip side is busy trying to keep me back from my blessings? And I'm not saying that I do that. I'm not saying that my brother does that. We were raised better than that. I say to you today that the last thing you should ever want to do is hurt your soul. Yet many of us, we are hurting on the inside today. God, he has given to us his word so that the values, the principles of his word, so that they can uplift us in our soul. So that they can uplift not just us, but so that they can uplift all of those that are around us because we would adhere to, meaning that we would live by God's principles. We would live by his values. Yet I say to you today that many of us, we are living in pain. Many of us, we are living in terrible pain on the inside as our soul is grieving. Now, if you don't believe me, as I often say to y'all, just take a look around you. And when you take a look around, I tell you that you will be able to see the hurt of many because what is going on inside of them that hurt their pain, it is being revealed through their bitter words. Their soul, I say to you today, it is hurting, and that hurt, it is revealed to all of us through the bitter actions that many people are taking in the world today. However, as sincere believers, I say to you today that we should be living by the principles. We should be living by the values that God has set for us. And when we live by his principles, we are able to produce fruits of the spirit. We are able to produce fruits like love, like joy, like peace, like kindness, and like faithfulness. Sin, as we know, it constantly tempts us in this world. Sin, it is often trying to pull us sincere believers back into the well of sin. Not only is sin trying to draw us back into the well of wickedness, we find that those who are our adversaries, those who live by sin, those who live in wickedness, we find that they do everything that they possibly can to knock us off track. They do everything that they can to knock us off the path of righteousness, to knock us back into the way of unrighteousness, to knock us back into the way of wickedness. That again is the way of sin. But I say to you today that, yeah, because the world lives in bitterness, that doesn't mean that you, the sincere believer, that does not mean that you need to live in bitterness in your heart. In other words, you do not need to live hurting your soul. As I have said so far in this series of sermons, we must have the courage to faithfully live according to the word of God. Now, here in his letter to the church of Ephesus, we'll see that Paul, he wrote to the Ephesians on this very thought. We'll see that he said to them there in the 22nd and in the 23rd verse, he said to them, put off concerning your former conduct. He said to them, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. 
You see, he was saying to Paul, what I say to you today, your form of conduct, it does nothing for you. Your form of conduct, it does nothing. If you choose to live by it, it does nothing but hurt your soul. So why would you choose to live as you once did when you were a sinner? Now, Jesus, he addressed this same church. And we have seen this before from the book of Revelation. I don't know if you all will remember the second chapter of Revelation. But in the second chapter of Revelation, in the first and in the second verse of that chapter, you'll see where Jesus, he spoke to the Ephesian church, the church of Ephesus. And at first he complimented this church for their labor. In their labor, those who were of this church, they, Jesus said, they didn't bear those who were evil nor those that claim to be apostles. They didn't bear them as well as they proved them to be liars. Now, while these things sound great, we'll see that something was going terribly wrong with the Ephesian church. In Jesus, we will see there in the fourth verse of the second chapter of Revelation, we'll see that he rebuked this church. And the reason why he rebuked this church was because they had left the love that they had when they first began to believe. You see, those who were of this church, they were becoming bitter. They were becoming bitter, and in doing this, Jesus said there in the fifth verse, if you're looking at the second chapter of Revelation, the Ephesians, they had moved from doing the first works. Now, what this meant is that the Ephesians, they were moving in a direction from laboring in sincere. They were moving from a direction from laboring in genuine faith. I wonder today how many of us have done this. How many of us have moved away from the passion? How many of us have moved away from the joy that we had in God when we first believed in him? See, I tell you today that, that when I first believed in the Lord as a little boy, I was so excited. I was so happy. I couldn't wait to get to Sunday school at Zion Hill. You know, yeah, they had the little candy that they would give us. You know, that always excited me as well. But I love learning about Jesus. Mom would tell you, if dad was still here, he would tell you as well. When I was in kindergarten, I was sitting out and draw churches because I love church. That was my passion. I don't know if all of you was the same way when you first believed. My hope is that you were the same way. But again, I ask today, how many of us have that same joy? How many of us have that same passion? How many of us have that same love for the Lord when we first believed? How many of us still have that today? Or how many of us have been influenced by this world? See, the labor of the Ephesian church, we should understand today, it was a labor that was actually incomplete. Their labor was incomplete because there was no compassion in their hearts. You see, we as believers, we are to be compassionate for all of those that are around us. Those who conspire against us and those who are even of the faith. We are to be sympathetic. We are to love all people. The Ephesian church didn't have that compassion within them anymore. You might say to yourself, Pastor, they, they, were, they were rebuking those who were wicked. 
You, you may say to yourself, Pastor, they was rebuking the sinner. That's what we're supposed to do as believers, preacher. That's what you may say to me. But I tell you today that their rebuke was incomplete. Yes, they pointed out the wickedness. They pointed out the sins of others, but they did not move with compassion in their hearts. You see, they didn't move to offer any correction to those that were doing wrong. They were simply going around and saying, hey, you did wrong. Hey, you did that wrong. But then they didn't say, hey, this is how you do right. How many of us are going around and saying, hey, you did that wrong. You did that wrong. You did that wrong. And then we don't show any kind of method of correcting the person that did wrong. We just love being a gotcha. I gotcha. I see that you did wrong. You did wrong. But then we don't move any further than that. If you do that, I tell you today that your faith is incomplete. Your rebuke is incomplete as well. You see, those who were of this church, they essentially moved in a manner where they despised all of those that were around them. I would say to all of you today that they were looking down on people. I would say to you today that they were acting like those Pharisees that we read about during Jesus's day. They had become more religion focused than faith focused, if you know what I mean by that. As we have seen before, religion, it can be cold. Religion, as we have seen before, it can be lifeless. It can be without life, in other words. Whereas genuine faith, genuine faith, it sets the heart on fire. You see, genuine faith, it not only sets your heart on fire, as I preached before, but it will set the hearts of all of those that are around you. It will set their hearts on fire. I know this because I have experienced it for myself. My dad could set my heart on fire. As genuine believers, we must remember that the first work for all of us for all of us believers, it is a work of sincere love. In other words, it is a work that uplifts rather than destroys. So as we see here in my key verse, Paul, he encouraged this church. He encouraged the Ephesians to let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from them with all malice. That's what he said there in the 31st verse. You see, Paul's encouragement, it fell in line with Jesus' later message to this church. Jesus, he called on this church to repent and to return to the first works of the Lord. What scares me today about the collective church is how we seem to, and I've said this before, how we seem to be leaning more and more into bitterness. How we are a church that is becoming more hurtful, angry. We're becoming more and more, as I said before, we're becoming more and more apathetic in our hearts, where we're supposed to be compassionate in our hearts. There are many believers who, like those who are of this church, they are quick to point out when somebody has done wrong. I know this because I have seen it with my own eyes. Where people love to jab their finger in somebody's chest and say, you are a sinner. But then they won't offer a hand to help pull them away out of their sins. You see, we have been tasked with the task of offering our hand to pull somebody out of sin. We ought to show people the word of God, living by the word, testifying of the word, preaching the word, showing them God's love, showing them his mercy, showing them God's forgiveness. You see, bitterness and apathy growing in your heart is how you hurt your soul. 
And I say to you today that many of us as believers, we are hurting on the inside because our faith is incomplete. We ought to be moving out of love today, but many of us as believers, we're doing everything but moving out of love today. We ought to be compassionate in our hearts today as the children of the Lord today. But we are anything but compassionate in our hearts today. And my proof of this is our actions, the words that we say. They are lacking in faith in the Lord. Do you realize how much a lack of love or care for others? Do you realize how much that can hurt your soul? Do you realize how much that can hurt you on the inside? How can we, the sincere believer, how can we produce the righteousness of God if we are swift to anger and slow to love? If we are swift to move in hatred and slow to move in love, how can we produce the righteousness of the Lord? That is what we've been called to do, isn't it? To produce the works of God his holiness and his righteousness. James, he, he said it best when he wrote that we as believers, we ought to be more swift to hear. We ought to be more swift to listen and slow to speak. We should be slow to wrath. And the reason why that is, James, he said, is because the wrath of man, it does not produce the righteousness of the Lord. Sadly, I don't believe many of us realize how much we are hurting ourselves how much we are hurting our soul by how we treat one another, by how we treat all of those that are around us. You see, if we did, then we would make some changes. If we realized the hurt that we was bringing to our soul, we would make some corrections by how we are conducting ourselves in the world. As believers, we must understand that anger and hate is contrary to the spiritual principles and values that the Lord has set for us. As Paul said again here in my key verse for today, the will and work of God calls for us to be kind to one another. The will of God calls for us to be tenderhearted to one another. The will of God calls for us to forgive each other rather than to hold something over another's head. The will of God doesn't call on us to hate one another, to despise one another, to conspire against each other. So why do we do it? We ought to love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. And at the same time, we ought to love all people as brothers and sisters of mankind, humanity should love one another. Yet we let something like this, we let it separate us. We let something like this separate us. We let something like this separate us. What are we doing? What have we become? when God has called on us to be better than what we are. Mom told me just the other day that there was another senseless killing that just tore my soul. I, I, I couldn't even say anything. I just look at how we treat each other and all I do is just shake my head because it's so ridiculous. The anger and the hate that people have stored up within them and that is pouring out into the world. It is absolutely ridiculous. We must not continue to be this way because the only thing that we're doing is hurting our soul and then the souls of all of those that are around us. You can see it is rather difficult to carry out God's will if we have gone bitter and cold in our heart. Again, I don't think many of us understand the pain that we bring to ourselves, to our soul, by how we are living and how we are conducting ourselves in this world, how we are treating each other when we move out of bitterness. 
Now, when I think about bitterness and how we treat each other, my mind, it takes me to Joseph and the bitterness and the hate that his 10 older brothers had for him. If you go over to the book of Genesis, somewhere around about the 37th chapter, I work my way through some of these chapters. I try to reference scripture as often as I can when I go over Joseph's story here with all of you today. But Joseph, my, my dad's favorite was David. Joseph is my favorite. I love me some Joseph. I don't get to preach about him enough. But Joseph, he was the 11th son of Jacob, also known as Israel. And Joseph, he was truly special. Joseph, he was a dreamer. And he received his dreams. He received them from the Lord. And Joseph's dreams, they excited him. They excited him so much that he couldn't do nothing but uh, share his dreams with, with those who would listen to him because they made him feel so good. And we find in Scripture that the dreams, the first dream that he had that really excited him, he decided to share those dreams, that dream with his brothers. And nothing sounds bad about that. Nothing sounds awful about that, right? In the first dream, over in the 37th chapter of Genesis and in the 6th and the 7th verse, you see where Joseph, he told his brothers about how he saw the seeds that he had gathered and that he had bound together. He saw his sheaves rising above their sheaves and their sheaves, they ended up bowing down to his sheaves. This was a dream that it, it essentially spoke of Joseph one day being over his brothers. How do you suppose that made them feel? You see, when, 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 when his brothers, his older brothers, his 10 older brothers, when, when they heard this dream from Joseph, their little brother, this made hate grow in their heart. Their bitterness, it, 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 it grew in their hearts for their brothers and their brother. And I, and I would say to you that the older brothers, they should have known brother better than to hate their little brother. They should have knew better than to be bitter towards their little brother. And I say that because they were raised to know better than that. You know, I remember my dad, when, when me and my brother, as, as brothers would do when we have a little fight, <laughs> I remember my, my dad would say, y'all ain't supposed to be fighting each other. Y'all supposed to be loving each other. You know, that's, that's, how, that's how I imagine that Jacob and his brothers were, were raised. The older brothers, they, they should have knew better. But they despised Joseph. They, they already had a hatred for him because you know, Joseph was, was Jacob's favorite. He made a special coat for Joseph. And, oh, man, they didn't like that as well. You know, Joseph, he, respe he was receiving some, some special treatment. And they, they didn't like that. And then Scripture tells us again there in the 37th chapter of Joseph, in about the 9th through the 11th verse, if you happen to be following along with me right now, Scripture tells us that he dreamed another dream. And again, it filled, with, it filled him with excitement. And Joseph, he didn't know that his brothers despised him, that they were bitter towards him. He, he decided to share this dream with them again. And this time around, he decided to share it with Jacob as well. And, and we're told that in his second dream that, that Joseph, he saw the sun, the moon, he saw 11 stars, and, and they all bowed down to him. And again, after... Hearing this, guess how Joseph's older brothers, guess how they felt? Scripture tells us that they envied him. They resented him. And Jacob, when he heard the story, Jacob, he was curious of the dream. And the scripture tells us that he just merely kept it in mind. Now I ask all of you today, how would you have responded? How would you have reacted if your brother your sister, your friend, your acquaintance, your brother, your sister in Christ, your peers in school or in the workplace, how would you respond and react if they excitedly came up to you 
And they said that they had a dream where they were greatly blessed. Would you rejoice with them or would you despise them? Would you want to see them succeed or would you want to see them fail? Let us remember that God's word says that we should rejoice with those who rejoice. God's word says that when one is honored, all should rejoice with that one. As sincere believers, the principle is set that we should support the dreams of others. And when God has blessed them, the principle has been set for us that we shouldn't look down on them. We shouldn't conspire against them. We should rejoice with them. As rejoicing, it uplifts the soul. It uplifts our soul and it uplifts their soul. I have never seen where rejoicing has brought someone down. But the problem that many of us face today is that our values are all out of whack. What I mean by that is that we are selfish. We don't want to see people succeed. We don't want to see people happy. We don't want to see people rejoice. Where does this come from? Where does this hatred come from? We are too selfish. We are just like Joseph's brothers. Look at what Joseph's brothers did to him. Scripture shows us that they hated Joseph so much that one day they beat on him. You'll see it there around the 23rd through the 24th verse, the 28th verse as well. I'll speak to this as well. They beat on him. They threw him into a pit. And then worst of all, they sold him into slavery. I want you to understand here that Joseph's older brothers who should have loved him, who should have supported him, who should have been desiring for him to be greatly blessed. They should have lifted him up to his blessings. They should have helped him fulfill his dreams. They threw his dreams away. They literally threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. They sold his dreams away. At least they thought they did, but, but they didn't support him. They didn't value him. And because they didn't value him, they didn't value themselves. They didn't even value their dad. Have you ever despised someone so much that you have actually chosen to conspire against them? Have you ever despised someone? And I hope y'all are shaking your head no to this. Have you ever despised someone so much that you tried to hold them back from fulfilling their dreams, from being able to, to receive their blessing? Again, hope that you're thinking within yourself, no, I've never done that, Pastor. I wouldn't do that because that is everything that is against God's principles and values, the morals for which we should be living by. Hate like this, it is so damaging to the soul, yet many people are, are moving in this manner of hatred today. People move against each other in a manner where we don't value each other. We, we don't respect each other. Understand that if you don't value those that are around you, you aren't valuing yourself and you aren't valuing God and his word. I hope that you understand today that when you move out of hatred against someone, you aren't valuing that person. You aren't valuing yourself. You aren't valuing the vow that you have made to God. Therefore, you aren't valuing the Lord and his word. It's time for you to stop hating today. It's time for you to stop moving out of hate today, especially if you are sitting here saying that you are a child of God. It's time for you to cut that mess out. 
One of the saddest sights I have seen today is in the church where we don't support each other as we once did or as we should. We aren't training up future generations anymore in the church. We are, we are, we, we, at one point in time, we thought that we could do everything by ourselves and we wouldn't let the younger generation help. And now look at the church today. Where's the younger generation? They weren't allowed to help. The younger generation said, well, if y'all don't want me here, then I'll go elsewhere. Guess who we end up hurting when we move in such a selfish manner? We hurt ourselves and then we hurt those that are around us. The truth of the matter is that God has given all of us dreams. The truth of the matter is that God has promised to bless all of us. The Lord, we must remember, desires for all of us. He desires peace. He desires a future and a hope for all of us. When you try to suppress, oppress, and keep others away from the blessing that God has for them, your values, I say to you today, they are all out of whack. And again, what you are doing is hurting your soul because your values are out of whack. You are living by a principle that is of the world and not a principle that is of God. Your morals, what are they? At the end of the day, you are doing nothing but hurting yourself. And again, you are doing nothing but hurting all of those that are around you. Now, though Joseph was done wrongly, Scripture shows us that God was still with him. We know his story a little bit, don't we? Joseph, he was blessed and he was highly favored. As we saw in the Sunday school lesson today, hatred, it can't stop us when we're highly favored by the Lord. No man can stand in our way when we are faithful. We are going to get that blessing. And Joseph, he rose from being a slave to being a governor of Egypt that had the ear of Pharaoh and could advise Pharaoh on how to move. With the foresight that had been given to him by the Lord, Joseph, he, he knew a famine was coming and he knew that a famine would last for seven years. And so Joseph, he made preparations for that famine that was on the way. And when the famine struck the land, scripture tells us that the famine, it was wide reaching. It was so great that that scripture says to us that it was over all the face of the earth. Now, what we should understand from that scripture is that the drought, it was so great that all of the known land at that point in time was affected by that drought, except for one place was prepared for it. The place where a man of God was, a man that was of faith. Joseph, he had stored up a whole bunch of food in Egypt. The famine, it was so bad that in the 42nd chapter of Genesis, scripture tells us that Jacob sent Joseph's older brothers over into Egypt. They didn't know this, but guess who was sitting there waiting for them in Egypt? Guess who was over the storehouse of the food in Egypt? Guess who they had to end up going to for help? Guess who was about to feel a certain way in their hearts because they would see who was there waiting for them in Egypt? As you have heard me say before, those that are blessed and highly favored, they will always overcome your bitterness and your hatred. We, as sincere believers, we are blessed and highly favored. Those that hate on us, as I said in my, my last sermon, we're going to deal with them and we're going to overcome them when we move by faith. They can't do nothing to, to keep us from our blessing. And that was the case for Joseph. My parents, they, they taught me a very important lesson about life when I was a teenager. And I believe I have shared this lesson with all of you once before. The lesson that they taught me is that I have to be careful about how I treat people. I can't look down on others. And the reason why I can't do that, the reason why I have to be careful with, with how I treat people 
is because I never know whose help I will need one day. And that very much did come to be a reality. For five years, I was in serious need of help. And I am again very grateful that my parents, that they, they taught me that lesson. That is a lesson that, that we all need to learn today. That was a lesson that Joseph's brothers, that they would have wished that they learned. Joseph's brothers, they, they had treated him as badly as it gets. And now as life would have it, they needed his help. They didn't know it, but they needed his help. When Joseph saw his brothers as shown to us in the 45th chapter of Genesis, I'll hang out here for a minute. In the 45th chapter, when, when they came to him, he, he, he had masked his identity. They didn't know who he was. But in the 45th chapter, we see that he revealed himself to them. And when they came to realize that he was the one who was over the storehouse of all of the food, when they came to realize that they actually needed him, we're told that in the third verse there in the 45th chapter of Genesis, that they were greatly dismayed. Why do you suppose they were greatly dismayed? They were hurting in their soul because they knew what they had did to him. They knew that they had done wrong. They were in regret. And, and I tell you today that regret, it is a deafening pain for the soul. Regret, it hurts the soul. Our soul will grieve because of our regrets. For you as a believer, when you treat others poorly, you will hurt in your soul. And I tell you, your soul, it will be in pain. Your soul, it will cry out in pain. This pain, it is so great that you feel it in your heart. And, and all of us, all of us know that we have done wrong. All of us know that we have sinned a great sin. All of us know that we have grieved the spirit when we have done wrong, especially when we treat people poorly. Now, Joseph, I want you to understand he, he didn't hide his identity because he had some kind of evil scheme of revenge against his brothers. Joseph is, is what we should ascribe to be today in our hearts today. You see, Joseph, he wasn't hurting in his heart. You know, Joseph, he had the kind of heart again, that was filled with love that was filled with compassion and all that Joseph went through, we find that Joseph, he moved with integrity. Rather than letting his older brothers feast on their regret and how they did him, we see there in the fifth verse that Joseph, he moved out of kindness. He moved to help his brothers. Would you have been able to do the same thing? I wonder how many of us would have been able to do the same thing if somebody did us wrong. I want you to be honest with yourself when you think on that and when you answer that question to yourself. Because you know, I tell you today that many of us, we have been done wrong by people and we turn around and say, man, I ain't going to help that person out. I ain't going to do nothing for them. Many of us church going folks. When people speak against us, when, when they don't do us right, oh, man, we quit to go. Oh, they, when they fall down, instead of us running to, and to help lift them up, we, and then we, <laughs> look at what happened to them. And then we get back home and we, hey, 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 you, you know what happened to such and such? This is what happened to such and such. And then both of us, will we'll giggle together, we'll laugh together. Guess who's in the wrong the whole time? And we say that we are children of the Lord. Again, I ask you today, have you ever done something to someone that hurt your soul? And you come to regret it. How does it sit with you when you have wronged somebody? That's something that we should be thinking about today. 
When we grieve the Holy Spirit, I'd say to you today that it cries out to us that we have done wrong. You see, the Holy Spirit desires to move in holiness. The Holy Spirit desires to move in righteousness. It cries out when we go the wrong way because the Holy Spirit doesn't want us to be moving against the principles, the values of the Lord. You see, this is why Paul encouraged us not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God there in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. This is why Paul encouraged us to live by a different set of principles and values than our old ways. We should be moving by the principles and values of the Lord. We should be moving with integrity today. The same kind of integrity that Joseph had. That's what we should be moving by. Now, in order for us to move with that integrity, we need to let the spirit guide us in the divine truth of the Lord. There in the beginning of the fourth chapter of Ephesians, we see where Paul, he called on the Ephesians to walk worthy of the calling with which they were called. That is the same for us as believers today. We are to walk worthy of our calling. The principles we are called to live by again, they are of love. We are to walk in integrity. We are to walk with lowliness. He says there in the first verse, we are to walk with gentleness. He says there in the first verse, we are to bear with each other. He says there in the first and in the second verse, we ought to bear with each other in love. You see, how can my brother ever succeed if I am there trying to tear him down, if I'm filled with hatred to the point to where I'm trying to hold him back from his blessings, how is my brother ever to succeed if I'm busy doing that? How am I supposed to succeed if my brother on the flip side is busy trying to keep me back from my blessings? And I'm not saying that I do that. I'm not saying that my brother does that. We were raised better than that. We don't get to see each other as often as we once did. We don't get to speak to each other as we once did when we were little. But you better believe that we that for each other. You better believe that we uplift each other. That is how we are to be as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are to uplift each other to new heights. We are to be that way for all of those who aren't even within the church as well. The Lord tasked us with a great commission to go out to all people and to share the good news for the purpose of uplifting them to new heights. How many of us are doing that today? We despise the oppressor, but sadly, many of us have become the oppressor. We have become what we despise as others are trying to grow. Many of us are busy trying to say, hey, no. You stay down. We'd be busy trying to press down on them. No, no, don't you come up with me. Don't get up to my level. Why? Why are we that way? Don't become an oppressor. Don't hurt your soul and the souls of others by trying to keep people down. That is not the way of the Lord. As you have heard me say over and over again, we are to lift each other to new heights regardless of how one may treat us. If you desire to move with integrity, Paul, he says there in the 25th verse, he said, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Lying, no matter how big or how quote unquote small a lie may be, it still hurts. It hurts your soul and it does no good for the one that you are lying to. Paul, he did say there in the 26th verse again, if you desire to move with integrity, he said, be angry and do not sin. He said there in the 29th verse, he said, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace, not hate, that it may impart grace to the hearers. That is how we as believers should be moving today. You see again, what would I look like as a spiritual leader? What would I look like, most importantly, as a child of God, if corrupt words were coming out of my mouth? 
what I look like as a sincere believer, busy trying to keep people away from their blessing when I should be pushing them to their blessing. Jesus said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Corrupt words, they come from corrupt thoughts. That means that they come from a corrupt spirit. Corrupt thoughts, they lead to corrupt actions. A corrupt spirit will lead to corrupt actions. We shouldn't be corrupt in our heart today. We should not be corrupt in our soul. Being corrupt in our soul does nothing but hurt our soul. You see, nothing but good shall pour out of the heart of, of believers today. Nothing but good, nothing but love should pour out of the hearts of believers. I say this because we as believers, we should be abiding by the word of God. The word of God should dwell in us. The word of God is a word of love. And if the word of God abides in you, if God's love truly is within you, that's what will come out into the world today. Again, as you often hear me encourage, I'll encourage you once again, do better, be better, live by the word of God and let the word of God influence you. Not the bitterness, not the coldness, not the hatred of this world. Amen. 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 Amen.